Hi, and welcome to the virtual New York State Museum. I'm Dr. Lisa Amati. I'm the Curator of Paleontology at the New York State Museum, and also today we are behind the scenes, behind closed doors, three security doors actually, in the paleontology collection in a special room called the Dry Room. And I'm gonna talk more about this room in a little bit. The paleontology collection contains somewhere around a million specimens, and they're mostly invertebrates, things like trilobites and brachiopods and corals and crinoids. But we also have fish fossils and a whole lot of really important plant fossils. So we have a huge paleobotany or fossil plant collection. And today I want to talk to you about the world famous New York's fossil forests, specifically the Gilboa Forest. It goes back about 170 years to the 1850s. And this is when people started to find these tree stumps and tree trunks that looked like they were made of stone. And then in the winter of 1869 to 1870, a big flood came through Gilboa, New York, down the Schoharie River that runs through the town, and it eroded down into these Devonian or 390 million year old sandstones, exposing more of these tree stumps and tree trunks. These specimens were studied by scientists at the New York State Museum, and then they sent the specimens to Canada for further study. Now those specimens actually have been lost, which is a real shame. But in 1917, they decided to build a dam across the Schoharie River in Gilboa, and they opened a quarry called the Riverside Quarry for digging out rocks to use to build the dam. When they did, they actually found these tree stumps. Let me get out of the way of the poster. These tree stumps were actually standing in place how they had lived 390 million years ago. This poster shows one of those blocks being removed from the quarry. Now in the 1920s, Winifred Goldring studied these fossils and fossils of other plants that came from Gilboa. She would later become the first female state paleontologist of New York and is very well known for her research on these fossil plants as well as on other types of fossil specimens. So Winifred Goldring studied these tree stumps and she named them Eospermatopterus, which means dawn seed plant. Well, she didn't know and couldn't have known based on the information that she had that these weren't actually seed plants. These are plants that lived before seeds evolved. So she named them Eospermatopterus, but there was one thing she was still missing. She didn't know what the top of the tree looked like, and it would be a while before that would be learned. So let's take a look at some of the fossils that were found at Gilboa. The first two I'm going to show you are lycopsids. This is a modern lycopsid. You can find these growing in the woods and they're usually attached to each other by a little stem at the base. They're simple plants that today don't get very big, but in the past they could get quite a bit larger. This is hyenia. You can see the central part of this branch and then the little enations or leaflets that stick off the side. And then archaeosigillaria is the next one. Again, you can see by the size of it compared to my finger that these are much larger than the modern counterparts. Goldring also studied a tree called Tetraxylopterus. This is a fossil from one of those trees, and I'll show you a reconstruction of the tree later. So Goldring had all these specimens to study, but she didn't have the tree top. What she did have was some stems that you can see here. Here's another set here. And some foliage that she thought probably represented what the top of the tree looked like. And here's some of that foliage here. A nickname for this type of foliage is actually speckled barkyopterus. And if you look at the next specimen, hopefully you'll be able to see that the bark looks speckled. 
So she thought that these probably were fronds from the top of the Eospermatopterus tree stumps. She didn't know how tall the tree was. She didn't know for sure that these fronds attached to it. And she couldn't have known in what pattern they attached to it or how they were attached. So Goldring reconstructed the forest, as you can see in this image from the New York State Museum when it was located in what is now the Education Building. And she reconstructed these trees that came from the Eospermatopterus stump in the best way that she could with the knowledge that was available. So this was a huge display at the museum and it represented this fauna very, flora very well. What it didn't represent, because it was unknown at the time, was the fauna or the animals that lived in the forest. It wasn't until 1971 when a pumped storage station was being built in Blenheim Gilboa that they discovered first of all a new plant called Leclerchia complexa. And the way that they studied this plant was that they took the fossils and they dissolved them in hydrofluoric acid, which is really dangerous to get the plants out of the rock. When they did that, they found these really intricately, delicately preserved fossils of arthropod cuticle. And basically that just means that they found the exoskeleton of some animals that are like spiders or scorpions or centipedes, that type of thing. And they found these exoskeletons preserved in great detail. The first one, A, is an exoskeleton of something called a trigonotarbid, which looks kind of like a spider. B is actually the leg tip of a spider. Now, if you just have the tip of the leg, how do you know that it's from a spider? Well, actually, these little claws right here are a special adaptation for handling silk. So we know that that's a spider claw. D is a complete mite that was found. F is the um, eye lenses of an insect. And for a long time, this was the oldest known insect. A uh, one that's about 20 million years older has been found since then. And the last one is my favorite. It's the poison jaws of a centipede. So we know there were centipedes there as well. So Goldring reconstructed the plants. When this paper about the arthropods came out in the 1980s, we now knew about some of the animals that lived there but we still didn't know what the top of the tree looked like for sure. It wasn't until 2004 when some experts from the New York State Museum and SUNY Binghamton were doing some work at a secret locality. And we, we can't tell you where it is because we're still studying it. And what they found was incredible. They found a one of a kind specimen. They found the entire crown of one of these Gilboa trees. First, I'm going to show you this picture of it. Um, the picture is a little bit easier to see than the specimen itself because it was photographed using some filters. But now we'll pan down and see the specimen itself. It shows the entire tree crown from the fronds at the top. That's what you're seeing right now, our fronds. If you go a little bit lower, you can see the speckled bark, the speckled barkyopterus that makes this the same as the fronds that Goldring had studied that she thought went with the tree. And now as we're panning down, you can see these kind of indentations in the trunk, little scallop marks. Those were the fronds fell off as the tree grew. It would grow new fronds from the top and the ones on the bottom would fall off leaving that scar pattern. So now we're left with the same question that we had with the spider. We have a tree crown. Who's to say that this is the crown that goes with the Eospermatopterus stumps? Well, the scientists returned in 2005, just one year later, and they uncovered another nine meters of the trunk of this tree crown, and it has the exact same pattern on it as the bark or as the uh, outer part of the tree stumps. So that tells us that it went together and they were able to reconstruct the tree with a little more information to go on. What they produced was on the cover of nature that you can see right here. This is the top of the Eospermatopterus tree 
And then if we were to go down, we would see the tree stumps. Now, an interesting point about these fossils is that the tree stumps are named Eospermatopterus. And we often refer to it as the Eospermatopterus tree. But this tree crown actually gets its own name. Now, this happens a lot in paleobotany, which is the study of fossil plants. Somebody will find the stump and give it a name. Somebody finds the fronds and gives that a name. And then somebody finds a cone and it gets its own name. And then one day you find out all of these parts go together. Well, in paleobotany, they each get to keep their own name. So the tree crown is actually called Wadiesa. Now, finally, we move forward to 2010. And in 2010, the aging dam over the Schoharie, or across the Schoharie River in Gilboa needed to be replaced. So they reopened the quarry in Gilboa, the riverside quarry that Winfried Goldring had studied in the 1920s. And New York State Museum scientists and scientists from SUNY Binghamton rushed there to get whatever new specimens they could. And they also were able to map the quarry floor. Now the quarry floor represents a single point in time in the Gilboa forest. And each one of those little potholes is where a tree was. So they were able to produce this map that you're seeing now. And that map shows the relationship of the trees or how they grew next to each other. How were they spread out which trees interacted with the, which other trees. So the map gave them a whole lot more information than they'd had before. And the specimens that they collected were really, really important because most of what we have from the time of Winifred Goldring in the 1920s has been destroyed, not intentionally, but through a process called pyrite decay. So I'm going to show you what pyrite decay looks like. This is one of Winifred Goldring's specimens of a tree called Tetraxylopterus. And you can see that it looks almost like it's, it's exploded. What happened was there was pyrite or fool's gold in the fossil. And that pyrite or fool's gold breaks down when you change the humidity rapidly and in changing temperatures. So fortunately for us here at the New York State Museum, this room that we're standing in right now was built. And this room has uh, climate control that allows us to control the humidity, keep it at a constant low rate. And we also keep the temperature low. This allows us to store and preserve and care for these extremely important specimens that give us an idea of what a forest looked like 390 million years ago in New York. Thank you everybody for joining us today. I'm going to run to my computer now to answer any questions anybody might have. Thank you.